morning in Genesis chapter 30, <laughs> as we dig in uh, again, uh, just what a, a sweet place to be in. Uh, but at the same time, we, we see the issues of the heart coming out again. Uh, and it's just amazing how much it, it reflects the issues of our own hearts. Uh, it says, and in, in when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. <laughs> Wives, don't do that. <laughs> Uh, it, isn't it amazing as you look at this that you realize uh, she's crying out for children, but it's going to be in childbirth that she dies. And, and you just sit there and realize sometimes the things we ask for are not always the things that, that are going to bring life, that are going to bring hurt and pain. Uh, we just don't know. Um, but instead of being content with who the Lord was in seeking the Lord for all this, for his wisdom, for his understanding, she's in a place where she's just crying out for a work of the flesh. She's envious of her sister. We know that envy is not a good thing to have. <laughs> uh, but she's envying her sister. And isn't it amazing? Rachel had everything. It says that she was beautiful. She was well favored. She had Jacob's love. She was in that place where uh, she just had everything else but kids. But it's the one thing she didn't have that she was envious about. And we're always going to find something that we can be envious about. You know, if you have a, a red Ferrari, there's going <laughs> there's to be a new Corvette that goes by, and you're going to hang out your tongue and go, oh, and you're going to wish. Maybe I should have one of those in my garage too. But it's always the thing that we don't have that the Lord has kept from us that we might want, that we might desire. And really, we, we have to be in that place where we don't want to desire those things, where we want to desire the things of the Lord more than the, these things. Hold your place here. Go to First Samuel, if you would, for a second, chapter 1, because uh, this brings up about a great picture for us uh, with Hannah uh, in Penina, uh the two wives uh, of Elkanah that were here. Uh, and the more we multiply wives, we multiply problems, it seems like. But Penina had children, uh, and she uh, held them in front of uh, her and, and just brought her to that place, not of being envious, but having a different heart than we see with Rachel. Uh, and in First Samuel chapter 1 here, we see down in verse 10, just for time's sake, uh, it, it says that she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She was in that place. She was hurting. She was dismayed. She was uh, not in a good spot as far as being able to provide for her husband, the child that she wanted to. But she did something different than Rachel did. She prayed to the Lord. You don't see that with Rachel. You just see her crying out to her husband. Instead of taking it to the Lord, she took it to her husband, who couldn't do anything about it, whereas the Lord can. <laughs> and isn't it strange that we'll always put that onus on somebody that's close to us rather than putting it on the Lord? Because he wants to bear our burdens. He's the one that wants to carry us through the issues and the problems and the things, the weights of our life that we want to have. And yet, we'll choose something else besides the Lord. Isn't it amazing how much we choose the things of the world and the ways of the world rather than going to the Lord and looking to Him for it? Rachel didn't do that. And we see such a wonderful picture there because how often do we cry out uh, and pray for something uh, or or else look to somebody else for it, or else not even bother taking it to the Lord. Had breakfast with somebody that I hadn't seen in a long time yesterday, and uh, I wasn't ready for the situation that was coming to me. But instead of praying about it before I got there, which I should have done, hello, <laughs> I just went in my own strength. Oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. We'll just have breakfast. We'll have a good time. We'll laugh. We'll talk about things that have gone on, and then I'll come home. And, and he laid one on me that was just just shook me uh, for him, uh, for the situation that he was in. But it was just 
uh, uh, amazing to me as I got back in the car and started driving home that I didn't pray about it before I got there. Oh, this is an easy one, Lord. I can do this. It just, oh, instead of praying about everything, just let those things slide. It wasn't that I thought that God was too busy. <laughs> it was just that I thought I could handle it and it was going to be all right and I didn't have to pray about it. But what does scripture say? Pray about everything. Just, we don't know what's coming. We don't know what's going to be there when we get there. But what we do know is that God can and God does and to take it to him. But here's Hannah. She was in bitterness of soul. She prayed to the Lord. She wept sore. It, it bothered her. She prayed. Uh, she uh, wept. She was. All the emotions were there, but the Lord was in control of the whole thing. And it says in verse 11 that she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid and remember me, uh, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him to you all the days of my life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. He was going to have this vow upon him. But she cries out to the Lord, and she said, Lord, if you give me something, I'll give it back to you. And that's an important place to be. That's an important thing to have in our hearts. Lord, he knows we have needs. And we certainly all have needs. But Lord, if you if you provide that for me, if you provide that for me, notice she doesn't say when, she says if. <laughs> if you provide it for me, then I'll give it back to you. Because this is your situation anyway. This is what you're doing in my life. She sees that the Lord has control of this, not her husband, but the Lord. Rachel didn't see that. But what a contrast that we see here. What, what a, a, a beautiful picture that we have here of what happens when we go to the Lord with these things and we get his answers rather than trying to work them out ourselves. Well, Lord, I have a problem and here's what I'm going to do about it, so I want you to bless it. Mm. <laughs> Lord, here's my issue. What do you want me to do about it? Let me give it back to you so that you can lead me. And so that you can lead the issue and the problem and the fruit of the answer of this prayer so that it will be in the best hands. Because we don't always know the, the Lord's best ways. And sometimes we don't want the Lord's best ways. We want our way, but we want God to bless it. And boy, we start getting things out of order. And, and so here's Rachel back in, in Genesis here. And she's crying out to her husband. He can't do anything about it. So he gets upset. Verse 2, uh, uh, he says, And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, Am I in God's stead, who hath withheld from thee the fruit of thy womb? Uh, I, I'm not God. <laughs> uh, wisdom in there. I'm not God. I can't do anything about it. What do you want me to do about it? Uh, and listen to what it says in, in Job chapter 2, as his wife cried out to him for him to do something. Um, it says in verse 10 of chapter 2, but he said unto her, as Job speaks to his wife, because she told him to just curse God and die. Sounds great, great, <laughs> doesn't it, for a wife to say, I just curse God and die. You got two things against you. <laughs> but he said unto her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all of this, Job did not sin. It doesn't say his wife didn't sin. It said that Job didn't sin in it. Ugh. Jacob's anger kindled against Rachel. Am I in God's stead? What, what do you want me to do about it? Well, what he could have done, pray. Pray with her. Lead her to that place to pray with her. But we don't see that happening either. He's just getting angry with her instead of doing something about it. And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah. If he'd have prayed, verse 3 might not have happened. <laughs> uh, Behold my maid Bilhah. Go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. So she's getting a surrogate for him. This is going to be another wedding, another ceremony, another wife. Uh, he's going to end up with four. Didn't have to be, shouldn't have be, 
but God already knew what was going to go on. And, and I think it's just so wonderful. Man is going about his ways, but God's sovereign will is going to be accomplished in the whole thing because out of it is going to come the 12 tribes of Israel. So Israel is still going to happen. Man getting involved, doing it the wrong way, and suffering the consequences of it when God could have done it all through one wife, one husband, God's way. So there's God's permissive will, and there's God's right way, his perfect will. And he'll let us do what we want, but we suffer the consequences of it. We're going to see the consequences of all of this as he deals with four wives. Amazing. Going about his own way and having those things take take in place, but no prayer. Because we don't see in this anywhere prayer coming about. And that's another reason we had Wade do the, the prayer request again this morning, because there's so many needs and so many issues that we want people praying and not just acting because they think they have to do something. Just because we don't have something doesn't mean we have to do something about it. Rachel is doing something about it with no prayer. Jacob is going to do something about it with no prayer. And we see the consequences of it. And our hearts just break for the things that take place in people's lives when there's no prayer. It doesn't mean that we don't love them. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us when we do those things. But what it means is that we could have avoided those situations if prayer would have been first. Ah. (laughs) Behold my maid. She's going to bear me children. The trouble is they still, those children still are not going to be hers. They're going to be somebody else's. And she has to deal with the issue of giving another woman to her husband. That relationship would enter into the mix too. And another place of sin where there should only be one wife, one husband. And they have to deal with the consequences of that. So she gave him Bill, uh, her handmaid to wife. And Jacob went in unto her. And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me. Oh boy. And hath also heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Remember, she hasn't prayed. She just thinks that God is going to bless her ways. And we can put our own names in there. And as I was going over this chapter this week, it was just, that's me all over the place. I'll enter into something, do something. God bless it. Please, Lord, may it come out. In as much as we cry out and give God credit for it, <laughs> That doesn't mean it's God's perfect way. And that doesn't mean our hearts are right with God. It just means we're trying to put God in the mix so that we can have his blessing as well as have what we want. And there's here come the consequences. (laughs) Uh, And she's given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan uh, or judging. God has judged me, so his name is Dan, the place of judgment. And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again. Instead of being satisfied, well, let's go on and let's keep this going. Ugh. She conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister. Notice who she's wrestling with. Her sister. For what? Sisters aren't supposed to be wrestling with each other. <laughs> She's wrestling against the wrong one. She should be wrestling with God like we're going to see Jacob do when he comes back. The wrestlings she has are not supposed to be there. But this is part of the consequence of what's going on with envy and lust and pride and just a self-will instead of God's will. I'm wrestling with my sister and I've prevailed. You don't hear any pride in there, do you? (laughs) I prevailed. Nah, 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 nah. It just, ah, amazing. Her own sister. And we look at it as spiritually, and we see sisters and brothers in the Lord, and we see them receive something from the Lord, a spiritual gift or a spiritual blessing. And we go, God, how come you gave it to him and not to me? And when we get one, and we go, well, mine's better than his now. And we get that attitude Instead of just rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep, we want to prevail. We want to be first. She wanted to be first because she's in the flesh. And that's you and I all over the place, isn't it? Oh, Lord, help us. (laughs) Just see so much of myself in the midst of this, and it's awful. See my heart uh, as the Lord reveals it, and it's just 
awful. So she calls his name Naphtali, which means wrestling, of course. And when Leah saw that she had left bearing, so evidently, I don't know when she left bearing, but somewhere in there she must have taken a year off or something. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid. Oh boy. And again, no prayer, no seeking the Lord, just I want to be first. Because remember, Leah's trying to win her husband's affection. And she sees that Rachel has her husband's affection. So they're fighting each other in the midst of this. Can you imagine living in the same house? Oh, what an awful thing. And and you know how it is when you have a fight with your spouse and you're in the same house. It just, you stay in different rooms. When one walks one way, the other one walks the other way. And you just try and avoid. And Zilpah. Leah's maid bear Jacob a son. And Leah said, A troop cometh. <laughs> and she called his name Gad, because uh, she's born a lot of children for him now, a lot of sons. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bear Jacob a second son. We're continuing on in this. And she goes, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. Blessed. A blessing that's come. <laughs> Adding to just an amazing thing. Uh, Just looking, I'm happy now that I've done this. I'm happy that I've added consequences of sin upon sin. Really? (laughs) I, I really had never looked at it like that before. But just adding sin upon sin makes me happy. And instead of seeking the happiness of the Lord, we're seeking the happiness of the world. You know, in Scripture, it talks about being happy all throughout Scripture 27 times. You know how often it talks about being holy in Scripture? 752 times. We know what the Lord wants, but we want happiness, don't we? We want instant satisfaction. We want instant happiness, and we want to stay happy. All I want is to be happy. Well, the only place that there's going to be joy is in the presence of the Lord. It tells us that in Scripture, in the presence of the Lord, Lord, there's joy forevermore. It's in His presence, in His ways. We want to be happy. He wants us to be holy. (laughs) We got the first letter right. We just didn't get anything else right. (laughs) Lord, help us not to go for happiness, but to go for holiness. A troop cometh. Isn't that amazing? Name your kid a troop. (laughs) And Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. Nobody's really sure. You, you, you could read 20 commentaries and see 20 different interpretations of this, but it, it just seems to be something rare that was found. Uh, and they brought them uh, unto his, he brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said unto Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. Bring me this so that I can have this, thinking that this will help her uh, in her way, whatever it is. Uh, whether it's an aphrodisiac, whether it's a, a beautiful flower that was rare, whatever it is, bringing it, th- this will make my husband happy with me. And guys, the only thing that should make us happy is that our wives are holy. That's the greatest happiness. That's the, the greatest place of joy and strength. Is not what we get from them, but who they are in Christ. Because if they're what they're supposed to be in Christ, then they're going to be everything that we need to have as far as a wife is. Because God is going to be teaching and leading and holding on to them in a perfect way. Our our whole marriage system is, is not to make one another happy. It's to encourage each other to be holy. And for the body of Christ, we look at this because he's going to be our husband. And we can't give Jesus anything. Because he already has everything. The only thing he wants out of his bride is holiness. Mm. And that should be what we desire for our wives, to be an encouragement to them to be holy, for our kids to be holy, for our grandchildren to be holy. That's the greatest thing that's going to bring the greatest pleasure to us and to him. So she says, I pray thee, give me your son's mandrakes. And she said unto me, Is it a small matter that you've taken my husband? (laughs) And wouldest thou also take away my son's mandrakes? 
And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. I'll give you something physical instead of something spiritual. We're still working in the ways of the flesh. Still working to think that the flesh is going to bring joy and peace and comfort and satisfaction. She goes, Okay, you can have him tonight. <laughs> Isn't that sweet of her? What a blessing. <laughs> There's no encouragement towards holiness. There's no encouragement towards rightness. There's just an encouragement that, okay, you can take him, but I'm getting him back tomorrow. Uh, so Jacob comes out of the field in the evening. <laughs> no wonder he stayed out in the field so long. <laughs> Jacob stayed out in the field till evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me tonight, for I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. Can you imagine what he's thinking? <laughs> What a mess. But it still hasn't gotten his attention that, hey, things are out of order. You need to do something about this. Instead, he just follows along like a lamb led to the slaughter. Okie doke, do 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 do. I'll, I'll just come and do whatever. Whatever makes you guys happy will make me happy. Sometimes we can't make them happy no matter how much we do. The best thing is, Lord, help me to be holy and stay holy because that's going to bring the greatest results. Help me to do that, Father. So God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my hire. I don't know about you, but ladies, it, it just doesn't sound right that you've been hired for the night. Uh, we don't want to be those that hire. We want to be those that love. Because I have given my maiden to my husband, and she called his name Issachar, or hireling, or hired. And Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son. Oh, it's a poor lady. And Leah said, God has endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me. And again, she's trying to get her husband's attention instead of God's attention. Not one of them is walking in the right way. And you know what? The more we add to it, the more we subtract the things of the Lord from our life. Because all we're doing is seeking to add physical things rather than spiritual things. There's addition in the world's ways, but no addition from the things of the Lord. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons, and she called his name Zebulun, or adding. And afterwards she bare a daughter, and she called her name Dinah. We don't know if there's been more, but Dinah we're going to see later on, so uh, we'll, we'll see what that brings but isn't it amazing uh, that there's still no peace, there's still no direction, there's still no hope, there's still no working. Uh, it says in, in Psalm 37, verse 37, it says, Mark the perfect man, and behold that the upright, the ones that are upright in the things of the Lord, for the end of that man is peace. The peace that they were looking for, the contentment they were looking for, should have been put on the Lord. But the psalm says, mark the perfect man. Pay attention to him because his end is peace. It's not striving to get something. It's not striving to add something. It's just peace because it tells us in Scripture that Jesus is our peace. That's where our attention needs to be. And in the midst of it, we'll add peace to our lives. And it says in verse 22 that God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened unto her and opened her womb. Do you see in this, there's not one person in the whole family that's looking to God, but God is listening. God is paying attention, and God is blessing. He pours out his blessings on the just and the unjust, trying to get their attention, looking to help them to see that he's the one that's their provision, not the people that are around him. God hearkens unto her so much grace in the Old Testament. And there's people out there that say there's no grace in the Old Testament. There's only grace in the New Testament. That's, therefore, we're just going to teach the New Testament because that's the only place of grace and we want people to see grace. I think there's more grace in the Old Testament than there is in the New. It's just that that, that word is mentioned more in the New Testament than the Old. But God's grace is all over Scripture. Hmm. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. They're using the name of God, but they're not worshiping the one that's done it. And there's a lot of people out there that say the name of God, but it doesn't mean that they know him at all. 
They just want God's blessing without submitting to God. And you can't do that. You can't have the blessing of God and know it's him and have the favor of God without knowing the God of the favor. We need to know who he is and to walk with him. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. A little presumption here. (laughs) God's going to give me another son. I got one. I want two. What's she trying to do? She's trying to catch up to Leah. (laughs) And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, Uh, So the situation kind of changes, the picture changes, and we're back to Laban and company here now, Uh, the conniver with the conniver. Send me away that I may go into my own place, into my country. So he's starting to get urgings to go back. Remember when he was in Bethel uh, and he was thinking about the things of the Lord and the angels ascending and descending upon the ladder, that he said, Lord, if you're with me, I'll come back here. The Lord is starting to draw him back. The Lord is starting to take away the grace of Laban, replace it with anger, frustration. The grace is beginning to diminish. And sometimes that's a good clue for us that that we need to change something, that things need to be different. And this is one of those places. He's starting to get urgings to go back to his own country. And, And notice what he says, my country. The Lord had already told him, this will be all yours when you come back. He's starting to realize a little bit those little nudgings, those little urgings that God is real, God is true, and his ways are right. So he said, Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee and let me go, for you knowest my service which I have done to thee. And Laban said unto them, I pray thee, if I have found favor in your eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. <laughs> Isn't this sad? Because what could Laban have said? I know that the Lord has blessed me because of my relationship with him. But he sees it in somebody else and he says, I want that, but I don't want the relationship with the Lord. I just want the blessing. So stay here with me. (laughs) Uh, Can you imagine what the world is going to say once they realize as the tribulation comes? Where's those Christians now? Where's the Ten Commandments and the doorposts? on the halls of the Capitol. Where are they now? Uh, They're going to realize without the Holy Spirit and the Christians in the world that they're in trouble. Uh, But it's going to be too late then. Laban wanting that, it's, it's just like Rachel and Leah with the fighting. They want the blessing, but they don't want God ruling over them. Uh, And for you and I as Christians, we certainly need to be in that place. God, not only do I want your blessing, but I want you. I think it was Natalie Grant that that sang, uh, I want the giver more than the giving. I want the blessing, the one who blesses more than I want the blessing. And when you can get your heart into that place, then you're not looking for stuff, you're looking for him. And certainly that's the place that we want to be. And the whole family's got opportunity in this place to do that. And you and I can look back over our whole life and see that God has given us opportunity to worship him, to know him, and yet we've resisted. We just wanted things good, but we didn't want the one who is good. We wanted things right, but we didn't want the one who makes things right. I've learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. (laughs) Laban, you could have that. You don't have to look for what I have. You can have your own. And he said, appoint me your wages and I'll, I will give it. Stay here with me because I know there's a blessing when you're here. <laughs> Please don't leave. And he said, appoint me your wages and I'll give it to you. And he said unto him, you know that I, how I have served you and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou had before I came. And now it is increased into a multitude. The Lord has multiplied uh, the blessing that's there. The Lord has blessed thee since my coming. And now when I provide for mine own house also, and and he said, what shall I give thee? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything if you will do this thing for me. I will again feed and keep your flock. And there's something else that's going on here too. He says, what can the world give you that will keep you in this place? He says, I don't want anything from you, but this is what I want from you. He's starting to realize you can't give me anything, but God can give me everything. 
there's little inclinations that the things are starting to change in his life. Because as a conniver, he could have gotten almost anything out of Laban. But he says, I don't want anything from you. Let, let me get it as the Lord adds to me. He hasn't said it in so many words, but his heart is starting to change a little bit. Not conniving, but just looking and seeking. He said, I'll pass through all your flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted, all the ones that are despised, uh, and all the brown cattle among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats. Of such shall be my hire. Because remember, the pure colored ones were the ones that were favored in that culture. They were the ones that everybody wanted. And so he says, I'll, I'll, I'll take all the runts of the world. I'll, I'll take all the disbarred this, this, this and disbanded cattle and goats and sheep and uh, bring those to me. All the ones that the world doesn't want, I'll take. Hmm. Hmm. So shall my righteousness, verse 33, answer for me in time to come. When it shall come from my hire before thy face, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to your word. And he removed that day the he-goats that were ring-straked and spotted, and all the she-goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and gave them to the hand of his sons. And he set three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. He was still being faithful to feed and to take care of Laban's flocks, but he was starting to get his own. Instead of it all being Laban's, now some has been added to him. What's the Lord doing? He's adding to the things that he wants to give Jacob so that when he goes back, he has all that he needs to make the journey and to be in the land and have something there. Remember when Israel came out of Egypt, they had nothing while they were there. It was all Egypt's. But when they came out after the last plague, it says that everybody gave everything to that. Anything that they wanted, they gave to them. And what did they use it for? They used it for their journey that they had for 40 years. The Lord gave them enough for 40 years to get through till they came into the land. <laughs> the Lord knows what you need. You don't have to seek it by conniving or adding to it in your own way. You can let the Lord add it to your own life. What does it tell in Scripture for us to add to? Add to virtue, knowledge, add to knowledge, understanding, all those things. Those are the things that we should be adding to our life. Not another garage, not another bigger barn, not another new car. Let the Lord add to you the virtue, the understanding, the knowledge of who He is. Because that's what's going to bring your life into great fruitfulness. You can have all that other stuff and have no fruit whatsoever. And what good is it going to do you? Because you can't take it to heaven. And it won't add God's favor to you in any way. You'll just feel better about yourself because you can say, look at what I got and you don't have. Isn't that sad? But that's the way of the world. This is God's way. <laughs> And Jacob took him, verse 37, rods of a green poplar and, and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled, or peeled white, white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks and the gutters and the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Ritual has started. <laughs> He just gets all this stuff. Instead of thanking the Lord, he starts a ritual. Do you think peeling those, those branches and putting them before the goats and the cows is going to do anything for the goats and cows to have better kids and, and, and better calves? It has nothing to do with it. Just like us praying the Lord's Prayer 50 times a day just so that we have God's favor. Does it do anything for us? It doesn't do a thing for us. It's the condition of the heart. He's not looking at how many words we can spill out of our mouth. He's looking at the heart that says, Lord, I really want you. Remember the publican and the Pharisee? They're in the temple. And the Pharisee says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this man over here. Bless you. You got a lot of blessings out of that one. <laughs> he doesn't look and say, look at all I've got. He says, look at this guy. I'm better than him. What did the publican say? He couldn't even lift his eyes. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. The heart of one, awesome before the Lord. 
the heart of the other is proud and lifted up. And what does Scripture say about the pride? God's going to humble the proud. They're going to see that all their pride did nothing for them. But the humbleness does a great thing with the Lord. Hmm. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought cattle, ring straked, speckled, and spotted. <clears throat> and Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks towards the ring straked and all the brown and the flock of Laban and put his own flocks by themselves and put them not into Laban's cattle. And it came to pass... Uh, Whose, whensoever the strongest cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might receive or conceive uh, among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. God is just showing that he's stronger than the ways of the world. Ugh. And the man increased exceedingly, and he had much cattle and maidservants and men servants and camels and asses. He's starting to come to a place of just seeing all that he has, all the, the ways that have come through him and for him, uh, but none of the ways that were right before the Lord. Uh, but just looking at all of that and just seeing all that, that God is doing in his life, he just realizes more and more that, that he needs the Lord and he's going to start getting that urging to go to the Lord, uh, to come to that place of just seeing what God can do and what he can't. And he's going to realize it more and more. <clears throat> and we come uh, with those same kind of hearts that are just uh, before him, but yet we, we realize how what our hearts are like, that we still desire the things of the world and the ways of the world because we're still in these bodies, the natural man fighting against the spirit, and the fight is always going to continue. We see with the kings in the Old Testament when they, it says that they prepared their hearts to seek the Lord. When they prepared their hearts to seek the Lord, the Lord prospered them. It, it wasn't because they, they had something that God wanted it was because God wanted to bless them. He just wants to bless you and I. And for us, our, our focus certainly doesn't need to be in uh, when they're conceiving to put these trees and these branches before the cows and the sheep and the flocks and to put these branches before our bosses so we get another raise so that we can have more. But it's just to see him. It says this in John chapter 20. He says, when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. And certainly I think our encouragement today is, Lord, we need to seek you more and to seek the ways of the world less. Ugh. And this battle is going to go on. Don't get discouraged because the battle's there. Don't get discouraged about that at all. The Lord's just shown us. How important it is to be good soldiers in these days. But we look up, we see the Lord. And as we look up, he's the one that's the lifter of our heads, isn't he? He's the one that lifts up our heads. As we humble ourselves before him and just realize, God, you need to be over every part of my life. And so as we uh, prepare our hearts to take communion, what you're really doing, you're preparing your heart to seek the Lord and to remember all that he's done. That's one of the reasons we take communion. We want to seek him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We saw that in the, the responsive reading. And as we see that, Lord, it's just you that I need to seek. All these honors in the world are going to do me absolutely nothing if I don't have you. I can have the best cars. I can have the best property. I can have the best cattle and sheep and all the trophies. But none of them are going to matter anything if I don't know you. Because God isn't going to take those trophies to heaven. Instead, he's going to put those crowns upon your head of faithfulness, of honor, of seeking him, of wanting him. So as we prepare, uh, just humble yourself to that place of just allowing God to show you what you need in your life. We don't even know what we need. <laughs> we think we do. I need more money. I need an 8% raise in my Social Security. I don't need 3%. 3% is 20 cents a, a month. Whoopee! I can't even buy a piece of bread for 20 cents anymore. Come on. I need 8%. I need 20%. No, what we need is, Lord, I need you to show me what I need. I need to add 
to who I am, you, more of you. There's that song, more of you, less of me. Hmm? <laughs> more power, more love. I need more of you. So, Father, as we prepare our hearts, just show us, Lord, and, and help us to confess those things that, that are wrong, but also acknowledge you in the midst, Lord, that you're right. You're always right because all that you do is right. So, Father, have your way with us. Uh, minister to our hearts even now, Lord, as we seek you uh, to just know your presence. Holy Spirit, please fall upon this place. Teach us more of Jesus. Teach us more of you that we might rejoice in who you are, Lord. We thank you. We praise you for loving us. We ask that you just minister to us now as we seek you, just to have your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, and just as the song says, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, Lord, uh, your ways are always higher than our ways. We think it's going to be bigger government or bigger paychecks, a better life, more health, when all it is is just seeking the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Father, may our country, may our world come to know that. May we know it, Lord, so well that we witness of it as we walk through this world, Lord, during these days. We thank you, Lord, as we look at the cross. We see your, your body broken. We see your blood poured out. May we be at that place, Lord, at the foot of the cross, receiving from you all that you want to give us for real life, for real health, for real wholeness, to be rescued from sin. And Father, we thank you that you knew we needed to be rescued. We didn't even know we needed to be rescued. So Father, thank you for showing us the deeper things, the deeper way, the better way. And the better way is in you. Help us to have that in all our ways today, Lord, as we remember what you've done for us. We take this with thanksgiving. We thank, take this with hearts desiring more of you. And Father, thank you that you offer it to us. We take it in your precious name. Amen. <laughs> 